good afternoon. So um, I was in the classroom. I was in the classroom just over a year ago, and uh, it's it's fascinating to sit here and listen to the the myriad of options that we have um, for teachers now. But my question is around um, so the, the three R's that have been popular in, in recent years, this um, rigor, relationships, and relevance. Um, I've seen amazing classrooms that were technology rich, uh, teachers doing amazing things to, to engage students, to uh, get them excited. And I've seen technology rich classrooms that were mediocre at best. So I've seen classrooms that had no technology, right, that were extremely rigorous and extremely challenging. And so I've heard a lot today about the relationships piece. I've heard a lot today about the, the relevance, um, getting to different types of learners. But I would ask very much on behalf of our team, the systems design team at New Schools Project, um, if on your feedback sheets, be it on the paper copy or in the Google Doc, um, to hear about your thoughts. I mean, we have such a, a diverse group of folks in the room your thoughts on what role does the technology play in rigor in the classroom? How do we leverage everything that we've seen today and that we know is available to take kids to that next level, uh, to really bring in some high cognitive demand to what teachers are doing with students? Um, would very much appreciate that kind of feedback. All right, thank you so much. All right, thank you. Uh, so with that, we have about 20 minutes left, and I know we have some really smart people over here, so eight divided by 20. <laughs> so seriously, we would like to get to all your feedback, but I also want to be uh, sensitive to time. Uh, Jimmy, I know you have to leave a bit early, so uh, if you'd like to start, with uh, just literally a couple minutes. Sure, absolutely, seven or eight is fine, thanks. Um, okay, I'll do 12. Uh, so, you know, I think it's a very in interesting conversation. I, um, and it, the opportunities are unbelievable. You know, I like to uh, think about the end before we talk about how we're going to get there. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer that, um, you know, uh, so if you think about Facebook, right, and the kid, you know, my kid has a, has a Facebook profile and he's two and a half. I know it's kind of weird, but you know that Facebook profile will probably be his for the rest of his life, and he'll have all these memories and all this stuff, right? Kind of stored there in the cloud. Um, you know, the vision that I have for our uh, for my child and, and his future is that just that he has an education profile as well, and that you know, beginning from his first class till. Heck, maybe through when he's getting, getting trained at work, is that there's a platform and a centralized place where everything he's learned and all of the, the, the things that he has um, experienced in school um, and in these projects is stored and available to him. Um, I don't know if y'all are like me, but th there's not a week that goes by that I don't think about man, if I could just remember that geometry equation, was it angle, side, angle, and you know, what is the actual ratio? I gotta find the hypotenuse here so that I can make this cut on this piece of wood, right? I mean, it, and literally, you know, if I could go back to that class and I could, you know, actually talk, you know, if I could actually go back and remember and look at what Mrs. Mrs. Wood's problems were, I could easily kind of kind of recapture what I'd already learned versus what I had to do is go out, search on the internet, then there's some other person out there who's teaching it a different way. I get to the end point, but um, I guess my point is, is um, I'm very hopeful that we can move in the direction of sort of centralized technology-based learning because every year that we're not is a, is a year that I kind of feel like is, is wasted from, from that perspective. Great. Okay, there we go. Thank you very much. I haven't had that many people doting over me for a long time. Um, 
this was in, incredibly interesting, and I think uh, having it all framed uh, with what with what Glenn said as some of the uh, ideas uh, for the future of the of the New Schools project. I think all, all these are very very important fundamental questions, and I really liked seeing some of the ideas applied in practice from uh, discovery from all the cool stuff uh, Matt's doing up at uh, up at Radford. Um, but I really want to uh, make a point, and that is that you know as we discuss qualitative things and flipping the classroom and doing virtual reality programs, you know, uh, Matt made a good point that these things are on the, uh, the, the bleeding edge right now. Um, and, and bring your own device is still sort of on the bleeding edge. If any systemic change is going to be sealed um, and, and uh, be implemented in a, in a lasting positive way, it has to be evidence-based. And these are not qualitative, these are quantitative measures. The other point based on that that I'll make is that the goal of every educational institution is to do two things. One is to improve learning outcomes, and the other is to increase the operational efficiency or the organ organizational efficiency of the school itself and the system itself. If we separate the academic ends from the operational ends, then we'll continue to be siloed. In fact, I think technology can correlate uh, quite, quite reasonably and quite well and, and in a quite a quantitative way how it can improve both simultaneously. So I didn't, I didn't mean to be so standoffish, but I think it's your turn. <laughs> Thank you. Um, all the presentations were fantastic, so thank you very much uh, for putting the content together in such a short and but really meaningful way. The key takeaways for me, um, and I think it might be worth uh, something for the schools, new schools project to pay attention to, is the technology is available. There's different, uh, you know, there are many companies providing it. There are many ways in which we can do it. There's no barrier to that. But the biggest barriers are um, not quite in the technology itself, but in adoption in different ways. So the, uh, how do you get the community to uh, think that this is the most important thing for them to succeed, for us to succeed as a country? Um, then uh, teacher enablement, how do we help that? Not just from uh, providing materials for the teachers, but giving them the time to do it because they're so busy with everything they do. How do you get them to take some time away from their uh, regular um, work life to spend time to learn how to teach in the new environment? And then, of course, the, the, the final part I would, um, you know, I, I really like the, the statistics which said there is about less than 6% who don't have access to it. But because of that, we kind of don't let anybody get access to it. So let us not make the least common denominator drive the policy for what we do. What do we need to do to make sure that everybody has some access? If textbooks were made freely available to students, when I came to this country, I thought it was fascinating that every student got their textbooks. So we can certainly do something to make some of these devices available to the country, to, to all the students so that the, even the 6% get access. So these are the, some of the barriers that we should try and remove, um, and that will help us make sure that it gets adopted more, more easily. I think one of the things that, um, that I think um, probably should have been mentioned today that I, I really didn't hear is, is, you know, all of us have, have a goal here, and that is improving education for students. But at the end of the day, um, this is really a battle about money. It is a battle between those people who um, create content, uh, some, of, some of whom put it in a book, some put it online. but. You know, we, we can, we can, we're being a little naive if we don't think that it, at the root of all this, it is, you know, my, my gizmo, my product, my content is better than yours. So uh, I think as we work through these issues, um, it would probably be helpful to have a dose of realism in, in that space. Um, I think that um, another thing which is pretty clear uh, from the speakers today is that there's a lot of barriers in place already that, that keep uh, great ideas from taking hold. So one of the challenges that, that all the change agents have, um, no matter what part of the industry or school system or whatever that you represent, is you've got to break those barriers. And, um, and having uh, the opportunities to do that will be uh, one of the greatest challenges, I think, that uh, the education system faces over the coming years. I particularly liked uh, someone's <clears throat> um, comments about earlier um, about this whole concept of collaboration 
you know, I was fortunate enough to spend eight years uh, here at Red Hat. And at Red Hat, um, we were very uh, lucky to be able to build a business based on the whole concept of, of openness and collaboration and transparency. And the one thing that we learned, I think, and proved that you can actually create a business model around is that um, you don't have to necessarily invent it over and over and over again. And, and so I see a lot of school systems that, um, again, it's a part of a barrier here, that if, if I sell you software, hardware, um, the next best gizmo, I, I have essentially locked you in to a system that's going to keep you there. And it's going to cost you more to get out than it is for me to get in, right? And so that's, that's something I think we need to look out for in this space. Um, I think it was Barbara um, I wanted to, um, who was talking about um, open platforms. And I just wanted to mention um, the MIT Ocean Open Courseware Project, which has been very successful in that space and sort of at the collegiate level in bringing um, textbooks uh, or bringing uh, online learning capability to classrooms uh, over and above having to spend that $200 for the professor's textbook who's teaching the class. And uh, finally, um, just one observation again from having spent a number of years in the open source world, but this clearly applies to education. I think so many of you um, that I've heard they really get this, and that is that nobody is as smart as everybody. So to the extent that you can create that platform, create that opportunity for collaboration, where you not only take advantage of the smart people in this room, but the smart people all over the world who do the same thing that, that you do as a teacher every single day. And those school systems and those organizations that figure out how to do that are gonna be ones who succeed in the future. Thanks, well, <clears throat> as a, I'm sure I'm not the only humanities and social sciences graduate in the room talking about all this uh, STEM stuff and that uh, reminds me of our common motto which is there are three kinds of people in this world those who are good at math and those who are not. Uh, half of you will it'll hit you later why that's funny. Uh, two takeaways for me one is something that came up actually at an education summit held last fall uh, that some of you attended where the chancellor at NC State made an interesting observation, which was that <clears throat> we don't necessarily need to be about making all students STEM professionals. We don't want them all to be STEM professionals. We want them to be STEM proficient. And his observation was, uh, particularly math and science proficiency, is a predictor of success across majors at NC State. I'm sure that's true in all institutions. And that's important to know because it's intimidating. It would have been intimidating to people like me to get the STEM speech at an early age when that was not where I felt like my talents lay. Is that the word? <laughs> um, so I think that's important for us all as we message to people, message to students, message to families, that it's uh, not everyone has to go into an academic or, or career path in STEM per se, but the importance of proficiency is uh, applicable across uh, disciplines. The second is something that um, you know, Jane Patterson's in the room somewhere, she was a little earlier, I worked for her when I was about 12. And um, I remember something uh, in those days, again, as a, a non-technology person working on a lot of technology issues at a policy level is, I'm not driven, despite my job, I'm not driven by technology, I'm driven by what technology can do or help people do. And that's really where um, my, my passion lies, and I imagine many of us are the same. So one of the messages today that sort of spoke to that is that uh, really we're all, we're all about help using technology to blend internal and external external resources, not just for the student, but also for the educator. And I think that probably transcended all the presentations we heard today. Uh, and I think that's important to keep in mind. As others have said, um, I really enjoyed the presentations, feel like I learned a lot. Um, a couple of things that strike me as we emphasize the notion that it's it's enabling the adoption of, of the technology rather than the technology it, itself, which is, is really the, the linchpin here, is it strikes me that for whether it's for the teachers or for the students, it's making the changes and the adoption of the changes imaginable that is really the obstacle that we have to that we have to overcome. So um, going back to an, an earlier question I had about 
I still worry that we have an implicit monolithic model of what a great teacher is in the technology enabled environment. And that, and for teachers to adopt this with all of their different strengths, we need to be able to help them relate to what it means to adopt the technology changes in a way that leverages their strengths rather than turns them into, into someone else. Um, I also worry a little bit about um, slipping from, um, by wanting quantitative and regular feedback, slipping from the need for developmental feedback for students and for the opportunity for teachers to provide ongoing developmental feedback, that if we try to evaluate too quickly and too, um, I'm, I'm thinking of like where we're getting students into immersed environments, the student who learns it at the very at the eleventh hour is just as successful as the student who is learning it in very easy, even steps along the way. And I want to I, I worry a little bit about having this kind of the equivalent of quarterly return mentality for business in education. It's did I demonstrate learning enough in the past five minutes? Um, that's not the way um, much of of learning occurs. And one other l last point that, that I want to make is that I didn't hear us raising issues of providing opportunity for reflection on the part of kids. And one of the downsides of technology with its really rapid, ongoing immersion and entertainment and engagement is we need to also, if we want students to learn to learn, not just learn facts, not just experience experiences. We have to build into how we use technology that opportunity for sitting back and reflecting. And it's very easy when we make changes to lose sight of what we need to preserve um, as we make the changes to what we want to achieve going forward. Well, first of all, I want to thank Jim and Red Hat for hosting us here today. Uh, this has been new information for me on some things and I, I hope to continue to unlearn and relearn. I also want to congratulate and thank Tony Habit and his team for driving this conversation. This is so important and I think the challenge we're going to face in North Carolina is, is particularly this year is the political landscape because it's moving and I hope to the uh, educators and the policy ones of us who are very concerned about education policy in North Carolina and have been for many years, we stay focused on the prize of getting every child through school to succeed and learn. I do believe in the holistic approach and one of the things to every child, because it's all, it's different, it needs to be personalized. And I was encouraged by what I heard about collaboration today. I think another challenge that we're seeing is the silos that are in education. And we need to break through those silos and work together across the state of North Carolina. I'm hearing some very healthy conversations around that. And then the other thing that I've been very um, pleased to see is the educators that are starting to get out of the classroom and come and see in the business community. We've hosted superintendents, we've hosted teachers, we've hosted administrators at IBM. We, we do have the largest site for IBM in North America right here in North Carolina. And they're coming and asking us, because not only do we want to get these kids through the classroom, but we want to get them employed. And they're coming to ask us, what are the skill sets of the future that we need to be teaching? And I think that's a healthy conversation, and it's one that we're hearing today about the technology that can help us get there and, and get that student that is ready to be um, a work, part of our workforce. Pardon me. Um, I, I also want to thank the North Carolina New Schools Project for hosting this forum. This has been great. Um, and certainly, I think, opened up a lot of great ideas. And thank you to Jim and to Red Hat um, for hosting all of us here today. It's, um, it's been lovely. The, w the one thing I would say, and I would certainly echo um, the comments of my, my fellow panelists, who I think were all spot on, is you know, undertaking these types of efforts where you're really looking at transforming education is exceptionally difficult. And if it were easy, then none of us would be here because we would have just picked up the recipe book and we would have done it and it would have been okay. So I, I would encourage us to think about, um, as we move through this, all of the elements that my fellow panelists have discussed, which technologies, um, how, do we, how do we lead change, how do we effectively get educators involved, really require a very, a very crisp vision of what we think success looks like. And so I would encourage, encourage the, the schools project and encourage all of us in this room as we're thinking about 
um, the strategic vision for 2015 and, and what technologies ought to be deployed, that, that technology is really just a tool. Technology is really just a means by which to get from point A to point B. And frankly, whether it's ours or somebody else's or free or paid or whatever the scenario may be, if you don't know what you're trying to achieve in terms of educational outcomes for your students and in terms of excellence for your educators and effective leadership for your school leaders, none of it's going to work. It's going to be awesome. It's going to beep and whiz and have pretty colors and it's going to require a different charger than the last thing but it's not gonna necessarily get you to the point where your kids are effectively graduating from school and are learning the 21st century skills that they need in order to be effective in the workplace. So I, I, I think I'm echoing a lot of what folks said. Certainly the folks that presented today had some great ideas about how to achieve those visions and I think certainly um, that we're on a good path with the, with the work that the, the schools project has done to crystallizing that vision and figuring out what the right tools are to get us from point A to point B. And thank you again for letting me participate today. Thank you. Um, I don't know that I'm actually supposed to wrap this up, but I want to say thank you to Jim and to Red Hat for hosting us here. What a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. But I also want to directly address something that we, we tend to talk around, we almost hit a couple of times today. The technology's there to do this. What it hasn't been shown to be there yet is the will to do it, the political will. When do we stop treating our kids like a political issue? And that's not a dig at Republicans, it's not a dig at Democrats, it's a dig at everybody. We gotta decide if we're gonna be the best at this or not. Now, you know, we've heard a lot today about random efforts to change. That's kind of the way I look at it. You know, a great system here, a great system here, a piece of software, you know, there's a lot of ways to look at this thing, but ultimately, we got to start somewhere to get somewhere. And that's going to take leadership. It's going to take intense leadership. It's going to take a willingness to fail. Because those of us who are in business know that we fail every day doing it, and we're not afraid of that because it goes with the job. Um, and we have to be willing to do that. Teachers have to be willing to change. Administrators have to be willing to change. Our state leaders have to be willing to look at this differently. We have to stop looking at buildings as the end all and be all for education because our kids aren't learning that way anymore. We have to really, we have to start with a goal to be the best, to graduate every kid into life. We can do that. We've made huge. We've made some progress on that. And if you look at the new schools, uh, supported schools, many of them are now at or near 100% graduation rates. And if you look at one of the underlying statistics that's really important, is the change in the rate of graduation for African American males has gone up very, very dramatically. Ultimately, think about the impacts on society of of making that kind of progress. So, you know, we got to stop thinking about this old ways. We've got to start thinking about it new ways. We've got to start somewhere to get somewhere. And I still don't see the resolve for us to actually say, this is where we're going to start from. This means changing everything and the dedication to move forward with that. But I think we got the power in this room uh, to to have that conversation, we're having that conversation, and how do we get there from here? Thank you. One final point of wrap up. Thank you all for being here. Very much appreciate your time. We do want feedback. We have a couple of vehicles for you all to provide feedback. Please do. It's been great to have you here. Obviously, in the amount of time we have, we didn't get a chance to really open it up for discussion, but, but your feedback's really important. I saw a lot of you taking notes. We want those notes. So uh, please, uh, please provide the feedback back to us as well. Thank you so much. I really do appreciate you all being here. It's been a pleasure to, to, uh, to host you all and look forward to seeing the results. Thank you.